It is so good to see your faces and to be back in the sanctuary with you. I have missed you and I'm so thrilled to be worshiping with you this morning. Before we begin our service, just one quick announcement. Um, in my eagerness about preaching, I totally messed Will up. He was ahead of the ball, had the bulletins printed, and I changed on him. Um, so you will find an insert in your bulletin for the Hebrew scripture reading and the psalm today, which is entirely my fault. Um, so when Tim comes forward to read, please look at the first Samuel readings, not the ones that were originally printed. Let's take just a moment now and say hello to those who are around us as a way of gathering ourselves for worship. by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, you take away the sin of the world and have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are perfect. You alone are perfect. You alone are the most high. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ. 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Read from Samuel. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Danina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely to irritate her because, she, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple. Of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as an Israelite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But answered, Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, go in peace. God of Israel, grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. But Canaan knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Let us read the uh, song together in unison. Hannah prayed and said, My heart is exalted in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. Shall be shattered. The most high will thunder in heaven. 
judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his king. A reading from Hebrews. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since then have been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also says, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds. No more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Stones and what large buildings. And Jesus asked him, 
Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say that to, to, to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, be always acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Do you remember the time, many years ago now, when we used to take photographs and go to a store and have them printed and then place them in an album? But occasionally, we would take off a shelf and try to really look at and remember certain events. Seems like ancient history now that most of us have photographs cataloging every last one of our days at our fingertips on our mobile devices. But these older photographs played a pivotal role in our annual celebrations of the past, whether that was one's birthday, anniversary, service as a veteran, or other family milestone. One such photograph that was, a, that was formative for me was of my grandmother and grandfather after his service in World War II. The photograph has been widely absorbed in our family for decades, and I thought it told me all I needed to know about his service in World War II. It was only recently when Nick and I were searching for family names for our son that I spent more time with this and many other photos. I started asking my dad questions about the photo and was surprised to discover that I had gotten the story all wrong. Horace McGill, my dad's father, served in the 3rd Division 7th Infantry and saw action in World War II in North Africa, Italy, and France. He was shot in the back of the skull by a sniper in France. And while he survived, his brother, who was also shot by a sniper, did not make it. After his injury, my grandfather was sent to Newton D. Baker Army Hospital in Martinsburg, West Virginia, where he underwent a couple of dozen surgeries to reconstruct his face and adjust to life with a single eye. My grandmother moved to Martinsburg, West Virginia and found a job close to the base as a nurse's assistant so she could be with him while he recovered. The photograph of note shows the two of them just outside of the hospital, half of his face wrapped in bandages just before they travel home to Tennessee. He is in full military dress, and my grandmother was in her traveling suit, as one did in those days. In my narrative, my dad and my uncle were at home, eagerly awaiting their arrival. So I was surprised to learn that this past year that my dad and uncle had actually not yet been born. <laughs> I knew the story of his injury, and I just assumed that one could not go on to build a full life in the wake of such a traumatic event. But he did. Horace suffered all the ensuing mental complications you might imagine would come with such an injury. The ways in which my grandfather's injury permeated my dad's childhood and the last 15 years of his life were profound. And yet they all carried on. When we talk of veterans, my grandfather and others in our family, their legacy, legacy is unequivocally celebrated and for very good reason. And I suspect that for most families, the full story is much more complicated than a single photograph can capture. Celebrating what has passed can make us feel good. And it bears worth remembering that these celebrations would do well to be complicated. 
This week marked our annual celebration of Veterans Day, which followed on the heels of All Saints. And in each case, I wonder, I wonder how you treat the opportunity to revisit these celebrations. I'd like to put before you that one worthy reason to pause is to make space to go deeper. One reason to pause is to make space to go deeper. It is to have an opportunity to go below the surface and acknowledge all that has taken shape. The danger in simply celebrating a photograph or who we remember someone to be in a photograph or who we think someone is in a photograph is that our memory can be shaped by the photograph itself. For example, in the photograph of my grandmother and grandfather, they are below smiles from ear to ear. And yet there was little about their married and parental lives that was not hard or troubled. The way my family talks about my grandfather's injury, I just assumed it was very short-lived in the time that my dad had with him. But in fact, it was the entirety of his experience with his father. The photo and the assumptions I made about the story completely changed the story itself. Our readings this morning invite us to look below the surface in particularly pointed ways. In 1 Samuel, we are given Hannah's story and the text of her song. A scholarly summary states, this is the story of Hannah praying at the temple in Shiloh. Hannah is one of Elkaniah's two wives. The other is Penaniah. By all appearances, Hannah's situation is hopeless. She wants a child but cannot conceive and is consequently the object of Penaniah's ongoing scorn. And yet with striking audacity, Hannah goes into the temple and prays silently and fervently. So fervently, in fact, that Eli, the attending priest, thinks she is drunk and rebukes her. But Hannah's response is poised, lucid, and insistent. And Eli, humbled by his mistake, joins his priestly prayer to hers. Shortly thereafter, Hannah conceives and gives birth to Samuel, having, having silently vowed to dedicate him to God. Hannah gives birth to the first of the kingly line who will come to Israel. It is a power song of loss and eventually hope. Mary's song in Luke's gospel, which we all know much better, is mirrored on this text from Hannah's song. But here's the thing, you cannot have the story of Samuel's kingship without Hannah's struggles. The story of Jesus' sacrificial gift is only partial without Mary's loss and heartache. It is a hopeful, life-altering news that God has for us, but it is not without struggle. Interwoven into God's divine reversals are stories of lament and loss and upheaval. The gospel narrative from Mark, likewise, encourages us to look below the surface. As Jesus emerges from Herod's temple, his disciples comment on the temple's grandiosity. The temple was the literal and figurative foundation for Jewish life. It was seen as the single and only access point to God. Historians of the time tell us that prior to its destruction, Herod's temple dominated the landscape for miles around. Herod, you see, expanded on the previous temple, determined to make an impression on other rulers, and he succeeded. But there's a further paradox folded into the structure. The tabernacle, the room of the holy of holies, remained completely intact. All that changed was the extravagance that surrounded it. 90% of the temple was just that. For Jesus to suggest that the significant foundation would not endure would have been devastating and really puzzling. It took over 400 years to build. Surely God would not allow such a thing to happen. Further, this raised more questions than it answered. Where would God be found if not in the temple? Jesus moves those gathered from the temple to the Mount of Olives where they might gain some perspective. 
from the entrance. The temple seems to be all there is, but you know how it is when you sit on the top of a mountain, you can see further. Sitting beyond the ground with an ability to see the horizon, one realizes the temple is not as all encompassing as it seemed. It is massive, but finite. Only when the temple was destroyed did the work of reconnecting with God begin again in a deeper way. The shape of our worship reminds us of the ways in which God desires to do more than get a glimpse at the surface. God doesn't just look at a photograph. God looks at that which is left out of the frame and doesn't survive in the stories that become family lore. God looks at the whole picture and does not fear what is below the surface. God is not awed by our finest temples or our most beautiful structures. And as we approach God in worship every Sunday, we are invited to bring before God all that which we've had time to examine and the many, many things which still dwell below the surface unexamined. In this season full of remembrances, keep in mind that we intentionally offer it all to God in assurance that God has seen and will see every part of us and still Declare us beloved. Amen. Let's stand together and affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families and those who are For this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. Here, For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop. Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops, Beth, our rector, Amanda, our seminarian, and for all bishops and other ministers, for, all for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially the Diocesan Search Committee, 
that they may be empowered and nurtured with discerning minds as we seek to elect a new bishop. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the, all the blessings of this life. We exalt you, O oh God, our King. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. God of compassion and justice, help us in this age of great division and polarization to learn the art of civil discourse and compassionate listening with those who worship you through other religions, particularly our Jewish, Muslim, and Hindi brothers and sisters. Guide us to recognize your image, even in the faces of those who do not remind us of ourselves, looking past our differences to find our common interests and goals, that we may work together to bring healing to a broken world. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Have mercy upon us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins. Known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so hold us by your spirit, and we will serve you to us To be honored and honored. Through Jesus Christ. Almighty God, have mercy on me. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Warner. <laughs> Warner, this is your family. <laughs> Please be seated. Um, it is so, so good to be back amongst you. Um, thank you for this time for our family of three. Uh, we so enjoyed it and we're so grateful to have this time together. Um, and I want to say a huge thanks to Will, to Noel, to Rosemary, to our wardens, to Carolyn and Tom, the entire vestry, and each and every one of you who stepped up to lead um, during my absence. The people are what makes St. Michael's the special place that it is, and I'm so grateful uh, that I was able to leave and just know that things were going um, so well. So thank you, thank you, thank you for this time. Uh, Dan, do you want to come and share with us a good update on our stewardship campaign, please? <laughs> this is very important. Yeah, um, yeah, so I just wanted to give a quick update on the stewardship campaign. Um, so today's the day. This is our target day for all pledges to be submitted. Um, and the reason we chose today as our target day is just so that the vestry has an opportunity to use that information to plan for the coming year. Um, so where are we? we? We've recorded 35 pledges for a total of $187,000. Um, that does not include the pledges that are coming in today. So we still don't know exactly what the total is. 
Uh, but I'd like to offer my sincere, heartfelt gratitude and thank you very much for all the pledges that you have, that you have given to St. Michael's. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity to pledge yet, I'd also like to thank you in advance. <laughs> Just to prayerfully consider um, you know, the amount that you'll be able to support, uh, to, to pledge to support St. Michael's and its mission going forward. Um, we've got pledge cards in the back if you need them. And uh, thank you. I want to thank the whole stewardship committee um, and each of you who have faithfully given already and will be given. We are so, so grateful. Where's my buddy? As is usually the case at St. Michael's, there is lots happening. I'm excited. Next week, we will share all of our Advent plans with you, which have taken shape beautifully. Um, in addition, we are going to do a drive for doorways for women and children, a drive of um, hats and scarves and gloves in the next couple of weeks to keep those folks warm during the winter. And the deal is, is the drive just for children, or is it for the mothers and the children? It's for all ages. Great. Great. So we would take new new uh, gloves, hats, or scarves. Um, we'll be collecting them over the next few weeks to give to the residents of Doorways for Women and Children. Um, I want to say thanks also to all of those who helped to make the St. Michael's lawn look beautiful yesterday. I wish I could be playing in the lawn on the lawn with you. Um, I was at our diocesan convention uh, for eight hours yesterday, virtually. A lot of things happened, and I'll send you the email update if you. Um, I don't know if you need to kill some time. Uh, <laughs> lots, of important things, lots of important things, but something really, really remarkable did happen, which I want to bring to your attention. Um, and that is, um, we passed a resolution in which the diocese has committed to creating, uh, a, to setting aside $10 million as an initial payment in a fund um, for racial reparations. As you may or may not know, our diocese has a deep, deep story history with um, slavery. Uh, many of our churches were built by slaves. And so we have a lot to do to begin to atone for our past. So um, in the next year, we are to set aside $10 million as a diocese. Uh, so this is a first step. This is not the end. It is the beginning of the story, but it's a really big deal. Um, so I wanted you to know that that's a commitment that as a collective body of Christ, we have made, and it is to be celebrated. I think those are all of my announcements. I'm sure I've forgotten something, but it is um, so good to be back with you this morning. So let us walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself as an offering and sacrifice to God.
pray over our um, stewardship pledges first. Let us pray. Lord God, creator of the universe, we thank you for the gifts, talents, and abilities you have given to each of us. These are represented by the treasure we have collected and by the personal commitments of time and talents that are being made. We pray for the courage to continue to let our lights shine where they are needed most. May these gifts enable us to carry out the mission of this parish and the mission of the church in the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we ask your blessing upon this parish community and this stewardship community. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give them thanks. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. 
Let us pray. God of love, we thank you for bringing us together in this place on this day to honor and to celebrate you and your people, the living, loving body of Christ. Jesus told his disciples, whenever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Bless this gathering as a sacramental rite, a visible sign of your and our love for Even in the absence of the bread, let us feed on you, your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit in our hearts with faith and thanksgiving. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you and let us the most part. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As you go forth from this place, remember who you are and whose you are. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.